Heaven, it is our prayer as your people that you would place your spirit in our hearts that we could make you our everything. And yet we struggle. We struggle with our selfishness, the sins of this world and the like. And yet we're told clearly through the mouth of Jesus that he makes us free. Help us, Lord, to be free and to make you everything. To hear your word this day that it might penetrate our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So, um, today is Reformation su Sunday, right? We celebrate the Reformation close to October 31st every single year. You know, October 31st of 1517, we celebrate, celebrate uh, that day as the day that uh, Martin Luther, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther, placed the 95 Theses on the chapel door in Wittenberg as he stood against the selling of indulgences, the, the Roman church's practice at that time of selling indulgences. And, and I know in many people's minds that is uh, the time that the Reformation started, okay? That's when the Reformation started. So last year, for instance, let's step back uh, a, a, about a year ago, okay? Last year, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation on October 31st, or on Reformation Sunday we did it, and it was a great and glorious celebration, okay? And it was a time when we came together to recognize Dr. Martin Luther, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther and his contributions to the Christian church. Now, mind you, we always gather each and every Sunday to worship our Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship our Lord. But sometimes we find people in our lives that are worth imitating, right? Yes, Jesus came, and his life and ministry is recorded in scriptures is something to model for our lives. But then God places those people right in our midst that we say, wow, I wish I could be like them, right? So as I say, step back a year as we were celebrating the Reformation 500th anniversary, and some of you may have been, I think it was at the 9 o'clock service, that we, um, we all stood up, turned around, and waved, and they took our picture from the balcony. Well, what happened with that picture was that it was sent to St. Louis, to our church body's headquarters, for a contest. And guess what? We won the contest, right? We won the contest, and it was an amazing thing to win the contest. Now, I'm going to show you what we got here in just a little bit. Before I do, though, I want to tell you about uh, my past few days. My past few days, I've been in a training with PLI, Pastoral Leadership Institute. And I'll tell you, my, my heart's just full of so much that I've learned and, and embraced, and, and I'm going to reflect on it at the end of the message as well. But one of the things we talked about was imitating right? I wanted that word to kind of penetrate your mind as we think about imitating others, imitating their faith, their walk in faith, their life, and it's okay because they are what we might say mentors or models for the walk in the Christian faith. And so that's really what the Reformation is about. That's really the celebration. Yes, it's the celebration of Martin Luther and, and his boldness, but it's also a celebration of somebody who maybe modeled some things that we could imitate in our life, okay? So, we won. And you want to know what we won? Are you ready? I mean, this is big stuff. I've been hiding this in my office for several months now, okay? Here we go. We're one of only a few congregations that won this. There we go. Awesome. How do you like that? A little Luther, right? Oh, you got to love it. A little Luther. Yeah, and so... Guess what? We all need a little Luther in our lives, okay? We do. Now, I do want you to pull this. See up on the screen? This is in Wittenberg, and in Wittenberg, they had taken a, a monument to Luther out to refurbish it, and they uh, commissioned this artist, um, uh, um, Ottman, Ottman Horg is his name, and he, there were 800 of these things out there. You can see people walking amongst them. I think this maybe is one of the 800, all right? But here's what I do know. If you go to his website, you'll have to let Google translate it. It's all in German, but you too can have one of these, all right? 
Now, he's got them on sale. He's got a store there, and you can have one of these. I translated. I actually did the exchange rate from euros to dollars. This right here is worth about $500, okay? Now, if you want an autographed version from Ottman, it's just under $1,000. Now, here's my deal for you today. I'll sign it, and you can have this one for $850, okay? How's that sound? All right? Oh, but we all need a little Luther in our lives. Let me tell you why. See, a lot of scholars believe the Reformation, at least in Luther's mind, didn't really start with the nailing of those 95 theses. Actually, he recorded a time in 1519 when he was struggling. He didn't fully get the gospel yet. He had what some people know it as the tower experience, right? So Luther, here's the story. The, the theses had been nailed. There was all this discord and all. A bunch of the Augustinian monks had left the black cloister where they lived. And so Luther had this place to himself, and he was up in a tower. It was his study. And it was in this area that he was struggling with one word, justice, justice. See, we come together as Christians and we understand the gospel and the freedom that comes, how we're freed with the gospel in Jesus Christ, but Luther didn't know that. The church teaching of the day was that God was a just God and God would crush all sinners. All sinners deserve death. And he struggled with this justice of God. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he, this is really where he was just wrestling with it. He meditated day and night and could not understand a God to be loved and to be worshipped and revered who would crush sinners. It was that simple. As a matter of fact, he's quoted in one of his writings. He said, he said I do not love, yes, I even hate the righteous God who condemns sinners. Those are powerful words from this man we celebrate. Words that aren't easy for the ears to hear, but when you put yourself in his seat, he felt the weight, the oppression of the sinfulness on his shoulders. He didn't understand the freedom of the gospel. All he saw in like Romans 1.17 where it says, for in the righteousness or justice of God is revealed from faith for faith. And every time he'd read this word, all he could see was God judging him and pinning him down for his sinfulness. Luther, I know I told you before, went to his father confessor and, and confessed his sins repeatedly. And his father confessor told him, says, go Luther, go and commit a real sin so you've got something to tell me about, you know? He struggled and he was burdened. And then it was like an epiphany. It was like an epiphany because the latter part of the verse, for the righteous or the just shall live by faith. And he started to look at that live by faith and what does that point us to? It was just that little tipping point that carried him to Jesus. The fact and the truth that he already knew that Jesus died for all the sinners of the world and that God wasn't going to crush us sinners actively, but no, he was going to pass on that righteousness of Jesus Christ to you and I so that we might stand right, that we might stand right before God. So Luther now found himself in a place where he knew his sinfulness, but he also knew his Savior and the grace and love of God that was poured out upon him. And all of a sudden, it was like it was a freeing moment. And it's in that moment then that the true Reformation started, the theological Reformation. It was no longer about the sale of indulgences. It's now about the truth of the gospel for all God's people. And he was free. We all need a little Luther in us, don't we? Have you ever felt burdened by your sin? Have you ever felt pressed down? Have you ever looked at yourself and said, you know, I know God forgives sinners, but this one was pretty bad. I'm not sure. I tell you, um, I've had this happen more than once, but and when I was in St. Louis, specifically, this one just stands out in my mind. I had a, a woman that came into the church, and she wanted to talk to a pastor. We'd never seen her before in our lives, so I sat with her, and she just poured out her heart to me. She was in tears. She was a person that struggled with alcoholism. She'd been clean and sober for a short time, six months, a year. I forget exactly. And she was like, 
but God can't forgive me for what I've done. And she talked about how she had uh, been offensive in her drunken stupor towards family, friends, and everyone, and how they've all ostracized her because of it. But God can't forgive me. And I continued to say, you're pouring out your heart to God. And I tried to usher into the, to the, the, the seat of the cross so that she could see forgiveness in Jesus Christ. But yes, but God won't forgive me. And this conversation it lasted for a very long time. She kept coming back to the very same place. I'd try to take her to the foot of the cross, and she would continue to go back to the fact, but yes, God can't forgive me. Ultimately, we had a prayer, and she left, carrying that burden. And that sticks with me because that was one of the lowest points in my ministry. To have somebody, and you're trying to proclaim the, the goodness and the love of God given to Jesus Christ so that she might know the freedom from her sins. And she wouldn't hear it. Have you ever felt burdened by your sins? But Jesus wants to give us freedom. And that's what we see in the gospel lesson for today. In the gospel lesson for today in John chapter 8, we see Jesus engaging a people. I want to actually go back to chapter 7 because he was in Galilee. You've got to understand, Jesus' ministry primarily was all up in Galilee, his home turf, you might say, and occasionally he dipped down into Jerusalem. This was one of those occasions. And so it was uh, the Feast of the Booths, and, and the, he was talking with his family, his disciples, are, are we going to go? And Jesus says, no, 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 I can't go at this time. Well, the, the scriptures tell us, it says, but after his brothers had gone to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private, okay? So you would think Jesus is going incognito, but this wasn't the case at all because, as it is true with Jesus, where did he find himself? In the temple. And as he was in the temple, then he began to teach. And his words were obviously amazing people. And it's interesting because the Jews, some of them knew who he was, and there was division among them as to who he was. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 7, it says, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? And so automatically you've got skeptics in the crowd. Little do they know that Jesus was the offspring of David born in Bethlehem, okay? And so the skeptics arise, enemies are in his midst, and now you've got a group of, of religious leaders that throw a woman thrown at Jesus' feet, uh, at, uh, throw this woman who's committed adultery at Jesus' feet, and they say, you know, according to the law of Moses, she's supposed to be stoned to death. What do you say? And Jesus says, let who, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And at that, the people parted ways. Jesus continues to teach. And then he found himself amongst a very specific audience in today's reading. These were people who were believing. They were believing something. But I think they also reflect part of the trouble in our world as well. See, our reading today began, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I don't know about you, but those are just very warm words to my heart. If you're my disciples, abide in my word. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And yet, while that sounds warm to us and inviting, to others it's not, and these people included. Because they responded and they said, uh, they said, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you'll become free. They weren't hearing. He was trying to, to reveal the truth to them, but they weren't hearing. They're reflective, in my opinion, of people in today's world that are, at best, they're ambivalent towards Christianity, and at worst, well, they're enemies of Christ and of you and me. People who want to spit in the face of God People who'd like to see you and me removed from this church and this building torn down. People who are, are just haters to the nth degree. They won't believe. They don't want to believe. And they're just pressing against Christianity with all the means that they have. 
they need Christian freedom just like everybody else does. Jesus goes back now to this audience and he says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. My friends, that's a starting point for all of us. Luther knew it. That's what he struggled with. And we know it. And we come to worship and we're reminded that that's part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. But we live in this tension because we know the latter part of what Jesus says is true for us as well. He says... He goes on to say, The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. My friends, the son has set us free. We live in this tension. Yes, we're sinners, but we're saying that we're made free through faith in Jesus Christ. We've got a Christian freedom that breathes out of us. And what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like the people of God gathered together in worship hearing the word or praying the words of confession and hearing God's words that your sins are forgiven what does Christian freedom look like it looks like God's people coming together like we are here singing praises to God and celebrating all individuals that maybe are people to be modeled in our lives in the walk of Christian faith Christian freedom looks like people coming together and worshiping, embracing the sacrament of the altar and, and celebrating each and every person that's washed in the waters of baptism. Christian freedom looks like the people of God coming together and recognizing that we're families. You know what? You're my sister, and you know what? You're my brother. We're all family in Jesus Christ. That's Christian freedom, my friends. But for it, Christian freedom's not only found in these walls, we're then made free to go out into the world and share the love of grace of God in and with others, both Christians and non-Christians alike. Both the people who are burdened by their sins and the people who are at best ambivalent towards Christianity. To enter into relationship and to see people with the eyes that God has. Because see, God sees people through lenses of love. Oh yeah, his wrath poured out on sin, but his love is poured out on sinners like you and me. Christian freedom looks like a church that has a heart bent towards serving others when we're a sent people. And we've got our unique places and niches that we may be able to pour our, the love of God into the lives of others. Christian freedom looks like us collectively when we pull together and we do things like Operation Christmas Child or we support missions in Haiti and Poland and wherever else God sends us. Right now we got the Natalas, raising, they've raised money to go to India and support missionaries. That's what Christian freedom looks like. We're secure in who we are as followers of Jesus Christ and we celebrate that freedom that we have and carry that freedom into the lives of others. I want to tell you about I told you I was going to share an experience that I had at this conference. An experience that I had at this conference that I thought was just powerful. It was yesterday. It was at the end of the day. It was the last thing we did. And we were worshiping. We were singing. We were praying over and being prayed over and the like. And they had this whiteboard up in the middle of the room. There were about 100 of us. There were about 100 of us, and we each got two sticky notes. On one side of the whiteboard, it said, the words were written, uh, leave behind. And the other side said, take away. And so we were supposed to write on our sticky note, just one thing after these three days we're going to leave behind, and one thing we were going to take away from that conference. And so everybody went, and we lined up, and you got the microphone, and you shared, I'm leaving behind whatever, and I'm taking away whatever. And every person clapped and celebrated what that person had just shared. You know what I put? I, I put, I just felt convicted. It was a moment where I was feeling weight and I wanted to leave behind self-dependence. Self-dependence. I was convicted in a moment as I was hearing about Jesus praying all night before he uh, uh, commissioned the, the 12 disciples. And I thought, how often have I prayed over decisions as the senior leader of St. Peter? I'm tired of doing it on my own. I don't want to be dependent on myself. I, you know, I share in the words of Luther, if we want to learn from him, one of his sacristy prayers was, God, do not depart from me, because if you leave me alone, I would have brought it to ruin long ago, right? But then what did I take away? 
a renewed identity in Christ. Jesus is in me and with me in all that we do. And for me, that was a freeing moment. That's what Christian freedom looks like. What does it look like for you? You know what? It's good to be free. And we all need a little Luther in us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.